Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Tai, I'm a product manager with uh, Google Cloud Platform, and today I'd like to talk to you about accelerating marketing insight with Google Cloud. So, I do want to level set everyone. Likely need to run your business with facts and not feelings. To do that, everyone knows you have data you need to get insights from to ultimately make money. I mean, that's why we're all here. So as a business leader, what are some things I need to do? I want to get a single view of my business, I want to invest in my most promising opportunities, and I want to understand my customer. So wouldn't it be great if I can get a dashboard on my business, understand how, how all my different market segments were doing, um, how all my advertising was performing across all the different channels I was uh, spending money across. Hello? OK. And invest in the most promising opportunities. If you're in the advertising space, there's been an old joke. Uh, I know 50% of my ad spend is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. So how do you identify which 50% is doing well, which one's not doing well? And finally, how do you understand your customer? How do you understand and profile your ideal customer? How do you improve the targeting for that? Let's say you want to find, um, sorry, I'm just going to skip this. OK, so these are the things you want to do, but these are the challenges I face. So data lives in silos. Um, if you're advertising with us on Google, you already know that, say, on AdWords or DoubleClick, or DFP, or YouTube, these are all individual styles you need to connect to and pull into one place to get visibility into your customer. Now, that's just for marketing. What about your own first-party data? What about your customers, your CRM data, purchasing, invoicing? How do you get that all into one place? It's really hard to get insight into your customer if you can't even get everything in a single place to look at it. And earlier I said, well, you have to make a decision on identifying which 50% is uh, performing poorly or which one's doing well. Well, in the marketing space, there's 3,000 tools for you to choose from. So even before you decide which 50% is good or bad, you need, to, you need to make a decision as to which tools you want to use to help solve, help solve that problem. In terms of understanding your customer, we uh, spoke with a large bank, asked them this question, that was their answer. How much data? How much customer data do I use in my advertising tools? None, I can't link the data sets. So, what do you want to spend your time on? Do you want to be a business owner or a data plumber? Do you want to spend your time running your business or moving all the data into one place? Really, it shouldn't be this hard. And this is how cloud would like to help. Uh, earlier today, we announced the uh, BigQuery data transfer service. What it is is a data movement service from our largest advertising platforms into BigQuery on a scheduled managed basis. If you're a customer of AdWords, double-click Beta Campaign Manager, double-click for Publishers, or YouTube, today you can have your analysts move data into BigQuery without having any development effort required. Now, BigQuery is just um, where you load all of your data. That's great in isolation, but hey, what if you want to get your web traffic data in there? What if you want to get your mobile traffic in there? Well, Google Analytics 360 customers also have direct connectivity to BigQuery, and they will export their data to BigQuery for you as well. And finally, if you're a CMO or a marketer, you need to do more than just Google properties. So how do you get data from Salesforce, Facebook, Twitter, Marketo, uh, MailChimp, or, Market uh, yeah, or Loqua into BigQuery? We have an ecosystem of partners for you to work with to set up that automated data movement into BigQuery. So we've identified three steps to insight. The first step is collecting all the data in one place. With the BigQuery data transfer service, you can get AdWords, double-click uh, for publishers, double-click bidding campaign manager, and YouTube into BigQuery. Uh, with Google Analytics, um, they have direct connectivity into BigQuery as well. And for the non-Google data sources that aren't mentioned here, you can work with our partners such as Informatica, Segment, and Funnel to get your Salesforce data, Facebook, uh, Marketo into BigQuery as well. The second step is then figuring out how to make sense of it all. So once you get the data into BigQuery, it, it's pretty raw. Um, for those of you who, who are advertising professionals, you know that you have to inject your custom IDs into, say, DoubleClick, shows up as other data. How do you extract that from those uh, strings and make use of it? Um, also, earlier today, we announced a 
a product called Cloud Data Prep, which is a visual ETL tool that lets you clean up that data, again, without having to do any programming. So your analyst can then use Cloud Data Prep to clean up that data, extract those custom user IDs, and dump that into BigQuery. If you have a data engineering team, we have um, Apache Beam via uh, Cloud Dataflow. Well, if you want to do something more sophisticated than just simple extraction, you can use Dataflow to uh, pull the raw data from BigQuery and then dump it back in there, uh, cleansed and ready to go. And the third piece is the uh, analysis and visualization piece. So what I want to show here is that BigQuery is not its own island. Um, you can, of course, use a SQL to analyze the data in place, but we also support uh, exports to Excel. Um, you can also pull data from Google Sheets. And for the technical members of the audience, we do have JDBC and ODBC connectivity as well. On top of that, uh, BigQuery does work with a lot of existing visualization partners listed here. Um, Tableau, Looker, Google Data Studio, among many others, work with BigQuery out of the box. We're doing all of this to accelerate your time to insight. So next, I'd like to uh, hand the uh, mic over to a few customers that we've invited over. Uh, we'll have Mercedes-Benz USA come up, uh, as well as their agency, St. Pete Razorfish. Then we'll transition over to uh, Zenith, and we will have a fireside chat after that with New York Times and Hearst. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Granis from Mercedes-Benz USA. And uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be speaking with all of you today. I think most of you are a lot smarter than I am. And I'm the business guy. I'm not the programmer. So it's been really cool to see this, the breakout sessions and see how the mechanics behind you know, all the questions that I ask of our data scientists and engineers, you know, what actually makes that possible. So uh, it's uh, really cool to be here. So talk about what we're doing. So our data, as you can imagine, like most clients, we're getting data from all kinds of different places, from our websites, from our media, from our dealerships, from after sales. I mean, it just goes on and on. So like, like Matt was saying, most of it is in silos. So um, we're trying to bring all that together. So what, what we've noticed is a lot of the companies that are really doing well are working in kind of like a data as a platform space. So in order to do that, you know, our vision is to try to be at the intersection of, you know, not only are we um, superior technology-wise, but we can be flexible, we can be agile, um, we can be creative, you know, we can let the data power the decisions that need to be made to determine what marketing strategies we use instead of just kind of sticking our thumb up in there and hoping that we're targeting the right people and using the right message. Um, and then connecting it from all the departments within MBUSA. So are we doing, or is what we're doing helping our Vans department? Is what we're doing helping our after sales department, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then so some growth opportunities for us by having this connected data. Um, so obviously, I mean, it's really about being a customer-centric company. Um, you know, Matt mentioned having a complete view of your business. So for us, it's really about having a complete view of your customer. So I mean, it's getting away from that aggregate data at the broad level, demo level, to you know, what is Matthew Granish doing? Because the way I buy a car is probably gonna be different than the way the next guy buys a car. And so, I mean, we have KPI buckets and intuition that tells us that you start here and you do this and you end up there. But in reality, everybody does it differently, so you know, we really need to use these things like to generate internal efficiencies to, so we can track all of this. And so this is just kind of reinforcing that, putting the customer first. And so this is kind of like the path that you could say where you know, most companies are probably progressing. So we start off you know, with a very simple, basic, you know, retroactive look at what we did. And then we're trying to build the systems through the interconnectivity that we use the cloud for to get those real-time optimizations and to identify you know, what are the things that the people who are converting doing and how is that different than the people who are not converting so we can target the converters more efficiently. So as we get towards that, you know, the highest bar, the customer centricity, obviously there's a lot of data that has to be processed and very quickly to make all of that happen. So, you know, you'll hear from our data scientists on why the Google platform, platform works for us so well. Um, for me, it just, it works really well because it's fast. 
So we don't have a petabyte of data yet, but if you saw that example at 12, um, they, they analyzed a petabyte of data in two minutes or something, almost three minutes. So if they can do that in three minutes, then ours is gonna be a, a walk in the park. So that's why I'm really happy is they're able to answer the questions that I have very quickly and I don't have to wait days to, to get the information that I need to inform marketing choices. So you know, just some reasons why GCP works. Um, it's quick. It costs less, and there's not a big implementation time. Most of our systems are already using a Google product of some sort, so the integration was very easy for us. Okay, and now I'll bring up Evan Rowe, the group science director, to get more into the nitty gritty. Thank you. So Matt talked a little bit about creating this integrated view of the customer and um, how that's gonna be a big part of driving engagement with the brand. And we see that across the board for, for marketing services. So across the digital properties, across uh, CRM and direct marketing, across media, and, and then really across the board for things like understanding lifetime value and, uh, and even driving accountability through, uh, through ROI analyses. And of course, this isn't always so simple, right? There are a lot of challenges that, that we're gonna face to make this vision come to life. And one of the biggest challenges is there's a really, really big ecosystem of data here. So we have all of this social and media data, which, which as you know, there's, uh, it's massive. Um, we also have all of these digital properties, all of these apps. We have uh, CRM and loyalty systems. And then we have, as Matt mentioned, this sort of distributed dealer network that all comes with its own uh, data. And of course, all of these have their own platforms and, and systems and tools for us to kind of wrestle with to bring this together. And, and coordinating all of that is, I think, a, a pretty much a universal challenge. I mean, obviously, the, the automotive industry has, has its eccentricities, but of course, I think every marketer really sees this landscape and they say, how can we create a single view of the customer? And to talk a little bit more about um, the actual scale here. So um, while I think that uh, Mercedes, you know, it should be easy to make this choice. It's a, it's a superior product and uh, it should be an easy decision, but the car buying experience is, um, it's very, very, it's a long consideration cycle, right? It's a big decision. There's a lot of planning and research that goes into making that decision. And so um, over these sort of months long decision process, we have so many interactions and touch points. So think about their, the millions of customers, all the platforms we were just talking about, and, and look at that over three to six months while somebody's really making this decision. We're talking about billions upon billions of individual interactions. And we can't really make sense of those without using statistical models. And so one of the things that we do is we, we have to, uh, to use models to kind of systematically help us determine who the right people are to target, what decisions we should be making. And so that comes with its own challenge because then it takes time and resources to develop, build, test the models. And those, you know, that process doesn't always lend itself to your more real-time use cases like serving digital media. And... Um, on top of this, so there's this initial, uh, you know, Google Cloud for marketers rollout that happened last fall, and they talked about, um, you know, some of the benefits and, and some of the some of the, what they envisioned for this platform, and it talked about collecting, analyzing, visualizing, and iterating on data, and you know, I think that's a very very good way to position the value of this for marketers, but um, for the future marketing, you know collateral for, for cloud for marketers, we're adding one more. We're gonna add um, Activate. And because we also see this as an activation platform. And you know, if you're going to create an ecosystem where you integrate all of your customer data across the board, I think there are a lot of additional use cases that you can activate outside of just this sort of time to insight and, and, uh, and driving efficiencies in the analytics process. And so just sort of an overview of our challenges and, and how we're addressing them with the cloud. As far as data collection goes, right, we have all these platforms, but actually a lot of them, as Matt mentioned, are already on, uh, on Google platforms, and so we were really able to speed up the data collection process by taking advantage of that. As far as analysis goes, right, we're kind of uh, building an EDW within BigQuery, which, as we know, is uh, it's a very fast, uh, reducing the querying time, and also we don't have any operational concerns anymore. 
as far as visualization goes, a lot of our use cases actually, um, uh, we, we're using Google Data Studio actually as a, as a dashboarding tool, which has been, um, actually it's, it's, it's met most of our needs so far, and um, obviously we can integrate with additional platforms if we need to. And as far as iteration goes, all of that time we were talking about that goes into developing models, we're able to automate them now in the cloud, and that's really speeding up that process. And then as far as activation goes, we also have um, you know, all of these use cases around personalization for the site and for CRM, and then also things like audience management for media, which we see as a really, really big opportunity here. So we really see a lot of extensibility to this platform and a lot of potential use cases that we can uh, apply it to. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to, uh, to Jeremy, who's gonna talk through uh, our actual architecture and uh, our experience so far working with Google Cloud. Thanks. Hello, I'm Jeremy. I'm uh, Associate Director here at Sapien Razorfish. Um, so I'm gonna walk through some of the actual architecture of how this was accomplished. So this is our essentially our basic architecture right now. Um, as uh, Evan mentioned, there's a lot of disparate data sources that we collect, so these are just a few examples right now. Uh, DoubleClick, Google Analytics 360, YouTube, Kenshu with paid search, um, even some stuff from MBIT for CRM for after sales, um, dealership uh, uh, relationships. Um, so kind of the basic walkthrough, and I should have probably put icons there, um, labeling what each of these are, so if you're unfamiliar with the actual Google uh, products, um, this may not be that beneficial. But from reading left to right, it's essentially we do use a combination of data flow and the connectors or data transfer service that Matt Tai had mentioned is, was uh, announced earlier today. Uh, we load uh, during a daily ETL process uh, Google Cloud storage backups in case anything goes awry. Uh, that's going down. And then reading to the right, BigQuery obviously is our enterprise data warehouse solution. Uh, visualization through Google Data Studio and a mix of Tableau, just depending on what our uh, individual stakeholders need. Um, and then moving more toward the automation and activation portion. Now, Evan had mentioned that we use a lot of more modeling purposes and uh, statistical means to make sense of all of this information. So we've been playing around with Data Lab uh, over the course of the last uh, three to six months. Uh, but a lot of our major our development work is done on Jupyter as a platform. Um, and we use Dataproc as a way to automate a lot of the modeling code. So that's on the far right. Um, so a lot of the modeling that's iterated on is either re-ingested back into BigQuery as a way to uh, validate and also um, a, a, to monitor as a performance mechanism, but also we use specific and custom integrations with different platforms to push information out. So the activation portion that Evan was talking about is a really, really important component to, uh, to our success. Um, so this entire solution architecture right now has uh, officially been registered as a partner solution within Google. So this is essentially um, how we've laid it out for Mercedes. Um, and so kind of the reasons why we, we went through this whole migration process. So we were on AWS before. Um, I don't really need to spend a whole lot of time. I'm sure everyone in here has uh, seen all the demonstrations over the course of the last day as well as potentially in the past. BigQuery is very fast. Um, this is not as impressive as the petabyte example that they had shown uh, at the 12 o'clock session, but essentially what we have found is the speed is really not determining how many questions we ask anymore, right? Like I could go uh, run a query uh, across gigabytes and gigabytes of data or terabytes of data and maybe go get a coffee or go to a meeting and when I come back, it may or may not be done. Um, I don't really have to worry about that anymore. I can kind of iterate on my questions and all of the questions from uh, Mercedes and get them back in a timely manner. Um, also mitigating the loss of productivity due to human error. So a lot of times as our analysts are running queries against uh, other solutions, uh, you, know, you, you write your code, you execute it, you wait a, a good amount of time and it comes out wrong. Um, I can mitigate that loss because it's very, very fast and I don't have to worry about, oh crap, I, I just messed up and wasted two hours. So this is essentially the, uh, a basis. So we know BigQuery was fast and we know it was a great architecture, but we already had the system set up in AWS. Uh, so really was the juice worth the squeeze in terms of doing this whole migration process. Um, one of the big hangups for us was we've architected a lot of custom integrations into Redshift, um, do we want to repeat that again? Um, so with the connectors or data transfer service right now, as Matt mentioned, we are, Mercedes as a, as a brand has a lot of products on Google. So leveraging the connectors was a very, very simple solution. So this is kind of like a one week process per, I believe this was double click at the time. So 
for engineers, this is, may or may not be very similar to the processes that you guys have uh, architected in the past of getting that data transfer files into a suitable uh, SQL warehouse. But essentially, the, the gist of it is um, we've gone from debugging Spark code and making sure that the scripts are automating correctly on an ETL process in a daily uh, fashion to can you or can you not fill out a form. Um, it's very, very simple to set up the data transfer process. You literally open it up, you type in your network IDs, you set a cadence, and then it just goes, and it's very fast. Okay, so we have the enterprise data warehouse. It's very, very fast with BigQuery. The connectors sped up the infrastructure setup as well. Um, so essentially, our reduced, uh, we reduce our delivery time for per performance reporting or analysis from any questions that Mercedes had uh, by around 60%. So we clear the way for getting a lot of the base questions down that they have, and as well as increase the sophistication of the questions that they would like to ask, because now we have a lot more time. Um, and this is like a little quote from uh, the last uh, analytics trends report from Deloitte last year. Um, so big data and traditional analytics are emerging. Um, so it's really, really getting harder to distinguish the two because the asks are getting more sophisticated. So setting up a platform like this has allowed us to scale our ability to answer those questions in a very, very timely manner. Um, increasing the time for exploratory analysis for Mercedes, um, as well as as an added benefit, benefit for us at Sapien Razorfish, is essentially you now have this great architecture Potentially, there are other great analytics storytellers or great uh, data analysts or traditional business analysts who may want to get their hands on this and sort of do a cross-train against your department. Uh, for us, at least, it's been a very, very great benefit. Um, a lot of people have uh, sort of flocked over to us and sort of we do little training sessions here and there. Um, so net-net, uh, cost, time, scale all have improved over the course of our migration. 80% uh, reduction in startup costs, not just time and money. Uh, big queries very fast, answer more questions that you need answered. Um, increase your allocation to generate insight as well as scale. So scale was the biggest thing for us is that as the questions become more and more complex, uh, we need bigger horsepower. So while sometimes we just use a general four core, whatever big query has, we sometimes scale it up in data proc um, and uh, uh, as needed. And with that, I'll hand it back to Matt. Okay, uh, next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Ian Lidicote from Zenith. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so Ian, Head of Data and Technology Analytics at Zenith. Uh, I'm a data scientist, and I'm still taking the drugs, so... Um, just to orientate our organisations, Zenith is part of uh, Publicis, the marketing services company, second largest in the world. And you've just heard from uh, Razorfish, which is part of Sapien. So we are brothers and sisters, you might say. Um, you'll see in the next slide that digital and the use of technology is having a huge impact on our business. And it's really for this reason that we see Google as a, and uh, particularly the cloud, as a very significant partner to us going forward. And you can see the scale of the evolution in our business between 2009 and 2015. And it's definitely um, connected consumers driving our clients, driving our clients for increased personalization that then in turn drives our business. And I don't see that trend changing at all. So we are, a, a, a Google is a very important partner to us and I see them as I distinguish Google uh, in particular as a partner rather than a software supplier. And we are heavy users of their uh, technology, the cloud included. And there's probably many people in this audience that are um, would have traditionally have been AWS users, and we're, we're no different. Um, but we didn't really have any interest in just switching cloud platforms if, if there wasn't a long-term benefit. And I certainly see Google as the long-term partner in the, particularly in the use case that I'm gonna talk to you about today. But we use, a, particularly as a, as a media agency, um, we are heavy users of the, um, the DoubleClick platform and have spent many years encouraging many of our biggest global clients to switch to an integrated Google ad tech stack for, for a lot of reasons. And that's enabled, to, enabled us to do some of the things I'm going to talk about in a second. So what's our particular use case for the cloud? Well, it actually involves artificial intelligence, which you might not expect to see from a traditional media agency. 
But it's because we've started to re reimagine what the digital media agency is going to be in the future. Now, what we're doing here is taking very, very granular cookie-level data from the ad server, fusing that with first-party data from our, our clients, and then applying a set of machine learning algorithms to all of that data to determine what is it that's driving the conversion or whatever the, the given KPI might be. But then, in a world first, we've taken that machine learned result and we pushed it back to double click. Now, that's never been done. Now, the reason we're doing that is not because it's clever and it's technically difficult to achieve, which it is. It's because we really want to think about the automated digital media agency of the future that's closed loop and highly automated. And that's exactly what you're seeing here. Now, this process started uh, nearly two years ago with Aviva as the, as the founding client. And just to give you an example, um, Aviva gave us access to their entire CRM data. And we are the only second uh, organization in the world to have access to their price elasticity data. Now, that means we know the connection, the, the relationship between the digital traffic for an individual, their relative price elasticity, and anything else that Aviva knows about that individual. So the application data, for example, that when you sign on for an insurance quote, we fuse that data together, applied a machine learning uh, technique, and then push that result to double click. We're steadily rolling this out for a number of our global clients, which means we need a cloud partner that will scale with us in this way. Now, in this particular example, the, the volumes of data aren't particularly huge. We're talking about between 50 and 100 gigabytes a day, so it's not enormous. But the point is, this is for every single client. This is not one use case for one client. This is all our major global clients. So as we move forward, that score that we're generating through machine learning is now a very rich picture of what we know about that cookie. It's what we call the smart ID. So that means that the factors that we're passing back to DoubleClick are a very rich picture of um, what role has content, for example, played in the conversion? What role has an individual campaign played in its conversion? And we're starting to unpick uh, content, for example. So assigning numerical values to text, video, and graphics. Um, because we want to understand what is it that's really driven the conversion. Now, I'm slightly heretical in my organization. And I don't believe that media always drives the conversion. It absolutely doesn't. There are many other factors that drive a conversion. And what we're starting to unpick here is what is the relationship between some of those other factors. And it's this is the, the primary use case that we've applied to Google Cloud. Now, in terms of um, performance, just to give you some idea of scale in that Aviva example, this is transformational stuff. We identified 83,000 additional quotes in that initial exercise in the first three months. And if you were to sum this up over um, the course of the relationship with Aviva just on this single project, um, a 15% reduction in CPA, which for them is, is very significant. And they're the first insurance organization uh, to even attempt this. So just in terms of um, specifically wrapping up on the, the benefits of uh, GCP for us, we've seen a 30% reduction in the client setup process, which for us is fairly significant because use of talent is a, is a challenge. A 20% reduction in hardware resource for machine learning solutions and a 20% reduction in computation costs, which for us, given the scale of what we're trying to do across um, something like 150 global clients, this is really quite significant. But probably the important thing is, um, just to close, as I see Google as the partner, not a software supplier. Thank you, Ian. Um, next up, I would like to introduce Damien Lawler, who will help uh, wrap us up. Thank you, Matt. Oops. Um, that's machine learning in action. Um, so you probably can guess from my accent that I'm Irish, um, and I actually love collecting pithy quotes. So touche, I loved that it was the juice worth the squeeze. And I'm delighted to hear that it actually was as well, but I'm gonna remember that one. Um, so 
I'm really just going to run very quickly through what, what Matt said. This is all about accelerating your time to insight. We recognize that time and the speed of response is becoming more and more important in terms of you being able to use your customer data or your customer's customer's data. Every single piece of data you can get, the faster you can combine all of those data silos together and drive insight, then the faster you're going to be able to differentiate yourself and really drive long-term sustainable competitive advantage. Our goal is to help you along that path. That's why we announced today the big query uh, data transfer service. I think there were some great stories about how people have actually been able to use that to, to assist, to make life easier, to be able to you know, take advantage of us building these connectors for you rather than you having to do this for yourselves. And then combine that, we recognize we actually want to keep working at this and adding more and more connectivity to more and more data sources making it as easy as possible to break down that huge problem we all have of data silos. Because if we can get all that data together, we can unlock very, very rich value. And then Matt walked through the three steps in terms of getting to insight, being able to use cloud data prep, cloud data flow, um, to clean data and get clean data into, into BigQuery. That we know that this is a really, really big investment step for many, many people right after the ability to be able to collect as many data sources as possible, and then an analyze and visualize. That's not where we want to stop. This is really just the beginning of what we're going to be announcing over the next, over the next months, because what we want to continually do is bring out solutions that make things as easy as possible for you to engage with um, cloud computing and really get marketing analytics in the cloud working for you. So over the next um, couple of months, you'll see us bringing out uh, packages of solutions that enable you to uh, consume cloud in as simple a way as possible. So a package that will include BigQuery Compute, BigQuery Storage, Data Prep, um, and various other uh, parts of the, of the cloud platform in a way that will allow you and your teams to start uh, really being able to expand the amount of querying you can do uh, exponentially from uh, where you might be now. Because our goal is that if we can give you, for example, a fixed price for a um, unlimited querying for on a, on a monthly basis or on an annual basis, we believe that will really unlock the creativity of your teams. So I think uh, please do come and talk to us about the BigQuery data transfer service, which was announced today, and data prep. And then in the coming weeks, you will hear more and more from us in terms of other solutions that we're bringing out that we'd love you to um, directly engage with us and we can talk you through. And in fact, we'd like to show you it because showing is much more powerful than telling. I think anyone who was at the 12 o'clock um, uh, presentation and saw how fast that petabyte got queried, uh, it's more impressive than me telling you about it. What I'd like to do now is actually get another two of our partners to come up and share some more stories and just talk us through what their experience has been to date um, in working with uh, cloud and in specifically in working with uh, Google Cloud. So, um, Alan Bofer, uh, Senior Vice President of Engineering for the New York Times, and Peter Yaffe, the data lead from Hearst, are going to join me for a fireside chat, but it's California, so it's without the fire. So we've all got microphones. Um, I'd like to start by saying um, we're at Next. So a lot of the day was, was based around what's coming in the future. But if you don't mind, I'd really love if both of you would actually talk us through your route into the cloud. What, was it, what were you hoping to achieve in that route, in that uh, road into cloud computing? And then the follow-up question is going to be, and where do you think you are against achieving those original goals you had? Maybe Alan, if you want to start. Mm -hmm. Um, what do we hope to do? A lot of different things. Um, we had a mix of AWS and a lot of not very well maintained data stores, which probably is common along a lot of us. Um, we had Redshift, we have on premise Hadoop. Um, I don't know who had that idea. Um, we wanted to collect a lot of that, put in one, you know, this you know, data lake um, concept, put it online, make all data, you know, a join join away. Um, where we are now, we've killed Redshift, we've shut down Hadoop. Um, we have a fair amount of our data in BigQuery. It's up and running. We're using Dataflow, using PubSub, um, and BigQuery is driving a lot of our analysis. Not all of it yet. We still have data sets to be moved. Um, 
one of the things, like we're not in the business of running infrastructure. Um, we were to some extent. I uh, want to get away from that. Um, we want to publish content, write content, distribute it. Um, so some of the things that drove us to Google Cloud in particular was the no ops attributes of BigQuery. Um, Redshift needs some ops. Um, we didn't do that very well. Um, BigQuery needs no ops and it's been so, so far it's working out really, really well for us and we don't need any people thinking about operations, which is amazing. And Peter? Um, so Hearst in general, uh, enterprise technology a few years ago um, decided as a, a general initiative to try and move as much as they could into the cloud and uh, away from on-premise. And they've, they've been doing that because of the efficiencies and the ease of use and how easy it is to add resources and things like that. Um, and in general, they've been very successful with that. Our specific group, the, uh, the data engineering and data science group, was only born four years ago. And so we've been entirely on cloud since the beginning. And that was initially all AWS. And um, you know, similar to Alan's story, we've been migrating over to Google Cloud over the last year um, because initially because of BigQuery and how fast it is and how cost effective for our use case compared to Redshift. And we have a bunch of Redshift clusters. We used to have more and they're really big and they're really expensive. And um, it's been very successful for us to be moving over to BigQuery where we can have a lot more data available for immediate querying at a much lower cost compared to what it would be to have all of that stuff in Redshift. In terms of the move to cloud, is starting with the data and analytics uh, platform on cloud, is that a good place to start for somebody who's maybe thinking about the journey to cloud? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's been some years since I did analytics on uh, data sets that were on-premise, and it's just, um, it, it's very liberating as a person who's interacting with the data to have it on the cloud, because it's so easy to spin up additional resources, to move data around, to get data into the database where you're going to perform your analysis. It's so easy to put Tableau or Looker on top of that. Uh, I, I can't imagine at this point doing it any other way. Yeah, I, I, data is really where you need like elasticity and growth. Like, like we're not going to get less data in the world, right? <laughs> it's only going to come more. You know, like it's going to be more and more prevalent. And like whatever business function you're running, there'll be more data, right? And, and doing that on premise, you'll be like provisioning from now and yeah, forever. Um, so I, yeah, I would say it's a good good place to start. You need it. And uh, I, I remember you telling a story in New York about how actually it was the data and analytics that you know, spurred some thoughts about other workloads then moving over to the cloud. Can you tell us a bit more about that journey? Yeah, so before BigQuery, um, it, like, or rather I would say BigQuery is really like transformed by how a lot of analysts do their work. Um, I guess they do the same work, but the, the BigQuery has enabled them to like kind of stay in this like inquisitive you know, asking the data questions mindset. Whereas before, they kind of came up with a theory, did a query and whether Redshift or Hive, um, and then went to lunch, right? You know, I went to a meeting and then came back and oh, oh, what if I ask this question instead or this and this and this? Right now, it's a much more like interactive session with BigQuery, which has really unleashed a lot of like analytics and thinking and creativity where you can like, they can query the data, see something come back, query it another way, Add more filters. You know, it's a much more fluid uh, workload instead of context switching all the time. Right? We do this, go to lunch, come back, like, oh, what was I doing? You know. So it's really like it's opened up for so many more things for us to have a much more interactive like session with the data. Just a quick question to the audience: How many in the audience um, are already doing data analytics in the cloud? Okay. So then I think this next question is relevant. Um, so for those that aren't, what are the pitfalls that you think people should think through as they start this journey? Maybe Peter, if you want to. Uh, uh, pitfalls to, to moving your data into the cloud we're talking about, yeah. Um, well, 
Gee, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, <laughs> there are so many advantages to moving to the cloud. I mean, I think that um, if you've got a lot of infrastructure on top of your on-premise data, you know, you've, you've got a lot of stuff to migrate. Um, <laughs> Getting getting buy in, you know, getting getting people on board, um, figuring out what tools you're going to use. Uh, my my experience with uh, data sets that were all on premise was that the tools on top of them were not that great. Um, <laughs> it was a lot it was a lot harder to get insights out, uh, and you know maybe that's specific tools that are that are uh, responsible for that. Um, but I don't, think that, I don't think that aside from um, getting your organization behind it, that there's a lot of, there's, there's not a lot of danger. I think that people are more afraid that there's going to be security gaps and things like that. Um. I don't know, like it's the same. I don't know if there are like big pitfalls. There are some challenges. Um, yeah, you know, making sure a security department, your infos infosec department understands what it's about and, you know, it's hard doing data center security, but, you know, Google actually has a lot of people that know how to do that that is hard to compete with. Um, it is easier to burn through some money if you're not careful. Like if you have provisioned hardware you paid for, you're not burning any more money there. Um, so. You can do some missteps and burn through the money, but you know, set up some quotas, and you know, that stops there. Okay, uh, so you didn't have, because one of the things I hear from other uh, people who are looking at this is how difficult it can be to break down the data silos or actually get individual areas of their business to um, cough up the data, if we can put it like that. Was that an issue for either of you, in terms of the? That was. That has not been an issue at Hearst. I mean, I would say the opposite that everybody wants to have their data in a central location, and maybe this is organization specific at Hearst, but uh, we, have, we have a lot of use across the organization with our common data set. And in fact, this has been great in Google Cloud in particular versus what we were experiencing in AWS. Um, it's just been, it's so easy to uh, provision users and give them access to different data sets and not just data sets in BigQuery, but other resources within the cloud, like compute and storage and whatever else you might want, that we have had such great adoption this year. It's amazing to me how many different people from different businesses across the organization at Hearst are using our data that we've been wanting them to use for years, and they've been wanting to use, but it's just been harder for them to get at it. Yeah, I think like once people, we had, we haven't had too much trouble. Um, there are some old flaky systems that are a little hard to get the data out of, but it's not because people have been actively resisting. Um, but we were talking about that just before, exactly. Like, it, like once people, you shouldn't underestimate the benefit of having a Google login and a web UI on top of BigQuery. Like it sounds silly. That, that's an enabler, but it really is. And once people see, they can just click a link, they're already logged in, here's a SQL interface, and they see the speed and the ease of it getting to the data, people are more than happy to like, get their data in there because they can see what that enables. Um, so, yeah. In terms of enabling, we, ha we had an interesting conversation earlier on today in terms of this concept of a democratization of data science, so that the concept that these tools were actually going to allow um, access to data into a much broader group within the organization, and that would unleash creativity within your organization. Is that something you're seeing, or you believe in, or where are we on that? So, y yes and no. Um, as I, I think also said earlier, like after the initial excitement, there's usually some frustration that follows quickly after. Um, just having access to the data doesn't mean you understand it. Um, so you can give all this self-service access to data you want and people like poke around in it and then come up with reports that don't make a lot of sense. Um, and then you read the green conciliation nightmare afterwards. Um, so I 100% believe in that data should be accessible to everyone, regulation allowing, uh, because it does open up. But that it just makes data self-service and everyone across the company will just dig into it and create their own reports or data signs yeah, I, I don't really see that working out in practice. <laughs> Anything different in Hearst? Uh, 
No, I mean, I would generally agree with everything that Alan said. Um, I mean, there are some there are some products coming out now uh, that are trying to get at that, um, and with the, uh, the the data transfer from like DFP into BigQuery, um, Looker's just been experimenting with a thing they call Blocks, which is like these uh, ready-made dashboards that you can plug in on top of your DFP that has been imported through the data transfer tool into your BigQuery, and uh, a a couple of people at Hearst have been playing around with that, and it looks kind of promising. So I think that you know maybe we'll get in that direction more. But um, I generally completely agree that uh, opening it up to people who were not inclined to uh, analyze the data is not going to get them to analyze the data. The um, some of the case studies we uh, heard from earlier, they talked about how you know, the benefits, the actual business outcomes that they were able to drive from this move to cloud data and analytics. Um, uh, are you comfortable to share any of the transformations or of the, any of the positive impacts that you've had in your own organizations? Um, you talk about like specific, specific products and things that we've built on that. I mean, uh, we take our, we take our, um, our click data and uh, pull it off of our 180 odd websites and put it through a pipeline and grab the, uh, the, the um, impressions that come back from DFP. And I've got a, a real time uh, revenue estimation tool that is built on top of that. So I, I'm pulling in all, all the clicks and I'm pulling in the, uh, the impressions and I'm merging that together and I'm estimating how much revenue is being generated, and I'm pushing that out to a tool that then is a, it's got a dashboard on top of it that our traffic buyers use to see high-performing CPMs, and you know, they look for opportunities to uh, buy traffic at lower CPMs and push it to those URLs that are currently earning high CPMs. So that's a, that's a nice example, I think, of revenue that's you know, real real world revenue uh, being driven off of the data. Thank you, Alan. We're a little further behind than that in our explore. It's more exploration right now, more what is actually enabled. Uh, more data sets in BigQuery that we can join together has enabled more exploratory analysis for us. For example, in advertising, getting DFP data and our click traffic in there and exploring other advertising scenarios and how that would actually affect uh, you know our revenue, but we are we're not where we actually built product. We're migrated products, data products on Telebit Curry, but we haven't built any new ones. So I've no no fancy things yet. Well, I think that leads into my next question, was which is what's next? So where do you see what what, what are you looking forward to building out over the next twelve to eighteen months? Oh, a lot. Um, more data sets, obviously. The more data we can get in and make it a join away, um, and then clean up all the data quality issues that will come out of seeing the data together. Um, no, for me, there's a couple of key things. Um, building data products, but like getting the funnel of like from a prototype on a data scientist laptop to a data product running in production, getting that streamlined, right? So really empowering our data science team to like do all their crazy stuff, you know, with R, Python notebooks, whatever, and then putting the machinery and the platform together underneath that makes it very easy for them to like run that in production and feed into whether they like, put stuff into BigQuery or feed to our product or whatever it is. Um, there's a lot of commonalities between all data products, you know, and, and getting that up so we can really empower the data scientists. It's really, it's something I really, really look forward to. Um, and then part of that is like closing kind of the feedback loop. A lot of we've been striving with, with pops up data flow, BigQuery. Maybe not bigger in that sense, actually, but it's streaming. I have most of our data streaming. I want more streaming data sets in there so we can do real-time models that feed into the product, change the product behavior, then see the user actions flow back into that and then close that feedback loop in many more ways. That's what I'm like really, really excited to see. So going back to the comment that was said earlier about activation being a really important outcome of this, that we want to move past just analysis to actually automate the outcomes and then use those outcomes to drive the product. In, in real time. And right now, like from a click hits our website, so it's available for querying in BigQuery, it's 45 seconds. So it's pretty fast. <laughs> and Peter? Yeah, we, we have much of the same experience. Uh, our 
Uh, our click into BigQuery is, is also under a minute. It's pretty fast. Um, si similar, I mean, we have more data sets that we want to bring in. And uh, because the technology is evolving so quickly in this space, um, we keep iterating on how our pipelines work and making them better and better. And I think, you know, right now we're interested in uh, uh, incorporating data flow and uh, some other products like that that we're not really using yet and uh, just trying to make our pipeline faster and more robust. It's, it's fast and robust, but it can always be faster and more robust. And maybe as a final question from me, um, you mentioned the technology is evolving very quickly. Where, where are you hoping it evolves to over the next 12 to 18 months? Where, do you, where would that, what would the evolution be that would add the most value for your businesses and the business outcomes you're looking to achieve? No pressure. Uh, that's tough. I mean, uh, just make everything easier and better. <laughs> We do have a few product managers and engineers in the audience, so... Uh. Yes. Like, I, like, just like BigQuery is like no ops, like more of those tools. Like, if we fully get away from, you know, spinning up servers or instances or containers or whatever it is, um, the more no ops tools I can put in there, the better. Um, I was pretty happy, I can't remember the, the name of it, but the PII detection tool you guys launched, you know, Getting that stuff in there, like automatically detecting PII, regulatory, you know, things that aren't as it should, you know, the more integration I can get between all those products in a no-opsy way, like, that's amazing. I'm pretty happy to see data prep. Um, but as we were talking about earlier, data prep is like one end of the scale and data flow is the other end and the somewhere in between. Um, looking for something there that is, you know, not the heavy-handed data flow. Not the somewhat simple data prep, but the in between, like that, that I'm looking forward for in a, in a no opsy way. Okay, so I'd like to close off the fire suggestion. So thank you very, very much to uh, Alan and Peter. <laughs>